Hello, my name is Glenn Hall. Today is May 17th, 2022, and the title of this video is Pray for the World. 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 Chuck Will's widow. Pray for the world. Chuck Will's widow. Chuck Will's widow. Pray for the world. 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 I recorded that video that you just heard last night. Um, it's the day after the Feast of Passover. It was the day after the Feast of Passover, but it was still a full moon, and I went outside to listen to a Chuck Will's widow. And as I was listening, it really sounded to me like that bird was saying, pray for the world. And so I felt, I really felt the presence of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's time for us to pray for the world. We now live in a horrifying world, a world that is terrorized from morning until night and all night. A world where our leaders take pleasure in taunting us and um, defiling us or attempting to defile us. A time when it should be clear to all why the prophets of God said, do not love the world or the things of the world. And so the Lord took me to several scriptures to bring this point home. And let's start with those. First, let's go to the book of Hebrews, little understood book, chapter 5. Every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. In other words, he's a man. Anyone who understands, really understands themselves, understands their own weakness, their own propensity to sin. And that's what he's saying here. The high priest that is chosen by God understands that, so he can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. You cannot exalt yourself into the priesthood so also Christ did not exalt himself to be, to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. We are now on the threshold of God saying this to many, to 
the 144,000, to the Kodeshim, to the Holy Ones. God will say in a day soon coming, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Melchizedek priesthood is about to be born, about to be birthed. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Kind of hard to imagine Jesus having to learn obedience, isn't it? <clears throat> In being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Then verses 11 through 14 of Hebrews 5. About this, about this order of Melchizedek, we have much to say, but it is hard to explain since you, you yourselves have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. The Kodeshim, the Holy Ones, the ones who are about to be glorified, the ones who are about to be called the sons of God, were the ones who were not dull of hearing. They're the ones who were teachers. They learned the basic principles of God, and then they went on and, and understood the solid food of God. This food, again, refers to doctrine, refers to truth, refers to Jesus Christ himself. And here again, in, in verse 12, you see food referencing the oracles of God, the scriptures. Solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Constant practice. The Kodeshim, the sons of God, are the ones that Jesus prayed for in the book of John. We're going to read that now. John chapter 17. You know, this is the night that he ate the Passover meal with his disciples. And it was the night that he was betrayed and captured and then crucified the next day. And so Jesus spoke at length to his disciples in this chapter, chapter 17 of John, is one of the things he said to them that night. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is eternal life, to know God and to know Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ revealed God. He came in the flesh. God came in the flesh to reveal himself to man. 
I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. You see, the Kodeshim believe this. They believe that Jesus came, that, G that God sent Jesus, that Jesus, in fact, was God in the flesh. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Now, pay close attention to this. Jesus is praying for his disciples. He says that, I am praying for them. And then he says, I am not praying for the world. Now, doesn't that seem strange to you? Why would he say that? I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, Judas, of course, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. The Kodeshim never fit in. The sons of God, the ones that Jesus is praying for here, they, they never fit in. The world always hated them, always despised them. Did everything that it could to defeat them and to harm them. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. To be sanctified means to be separated to be separated unto holiness and to separate yourselves from the sins of the world. And then Jesus goes on and says this, 17, uh, John 17, verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Now, who's that? Well, that's us. That refers to people who heard the disciples, heard the apostles, and then read the scriptures that the apostles wrote. The Kodeshim, the holy ones, in the 2,000 years since Christ was here, are those people who believed the word of God, who believed in Christ through the words that these disciples wrote. So again, verse 20, I do not ask for these only. I do not ask for only these 11 with me right here, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Wait a minute. I thought he wasn't praying for the world. See, here's, here's the answer to this mystery here. The last 2,000 years, and even time before that, were the times when God 
called the Kodeshim out of the world. When he separated a people to himself under the harshest of circumstances, under a world that was ruled by Satan, in a world that they could have walked into sin whenever they wanted to and partaken of sin whenever they wanted to, and they're the ones who decided, no, I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to obey God. Instead, I'm going to walk with God. That's what this is about. So God, for 2,000 years since Christ, has been separating people to himself. And prior to that, even, he separated people to himself in the nation of Israel and other places where he revealed himself to them. For example, the three kings who came to worship him when he was born. There have been people that God has called and prepared to be one of the Kodeshim, one of the sons of God, one of the ones who will be glorified in this event that is soon to come. And he did that so that the world may believe that you sent me. The world may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you love me, so that the world may know. The world doesn't know yet. The world does not know. If anyone thinks the world does the world knows God, that the world knows Jesus. You have deceived yourself. How could this world be this corrupt if the world knew who God was, who Jesus was? Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name. And I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. And so now the time has come where God is going to glorify the saints. The word saints is used in the scripture It's a misused word, and so I do not use that word. I use the word kodeshim. It means holy ones. God is going to now glorify the holy ones. The time of the birthing of the man-child of Revelation chapter 12 has come. The man-child is going to prepare those believers who are not yet ready to become ready. And also to provide for them in this time of terror that is soon to come upon the world. That's the bride. The bride is going to be prepared by the sons for three and a half years. And then there will be a manifestation. And we see this in Revelation chapter 19 where the bride and the rest of the Kodeshim, the sons of God, come with Christ in order to rule the world. Everything looks different than what we've been taught. And most of what we've been taught is an error. So... Take now John chapter 17. Jesus said, I do not pray for the world. Well, now let's look at uh, John chapter 3. And and you wonder about this. How then can the scripture say this? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, 
that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe it is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it might be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So God so loved the world that he sent his only son. And now we're coming to the time where God in the flesh, God in a multitude of people, in, in 144,000 people at least, will go to the world in order to save the world. Now people talk of a great revival coming. You cannot revive a dead body. And the Kodashim understand that they are dead, that they, their bodies of flesh have nothing good in them, and that the only way that good is going to come out of them is for them to be glorified and perfected. And where do we see that? We see that in 1 John chapter 2 and 3. In 1 John 2.28, it says this, and then I'm going to read up to... Uh, Chapter 3, verse 3. And now little children abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God? And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did, it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Now, have you ever considered what does it mean to be like God? That's what this is saying. We will be like God. Right now, we still see a world that is totally controlled by Satan and by the beast government that Satan has established. We see war now between the seventh beast and the eighth beast, the seventh beast being uh, the, power, the powers that be that have been in power for many years now, fighting against Donald Trump and those aligned with him, who is, um, Trump represents the head of the eighth beast. It's not to say that he is the only eighth beast, because many people have been part of the seventh beast government, just as many people are going to be part and are part of the eighth beast government. We will see the mortal wound of the eighth beast healed in about two and a half years with Trump's re-election. And then we will see, we will continue to see him fight against the Lamb as it prophesies in Revelation chapter 17. But we will also see the complete destruction of Babylon the Great as we see in Revelation chapter 18. And then we're going to see Revelation chapter 19 come. 
and I'm just going to read all of Revelation 19. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For his judgments are true and just, for he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Before I go on here, uh, I want to uh, recommend that you watch uh, some videos done by a woman whose name she goes by the title probably Alexandra. She does a very excellent job of portraying the the dark side of Satan and the light side of Satan. I did a a lot of videos, something around something like 30 videos talking about the mystery of the beast. And one thing to understand is that we are all the beast. Jesus came as a, as a baby. And it's written in the scripture that when he was born, they laid him in a feeding trough. A feeding trough for beasts because he is the food for us, the food for beasts. Jesus is the only way that we change from our beast nature. It's the only way, Jesus is the only way that we are clothed. The scripture talks about being clothed. And in the last video I did, uh, I talked about that. And there's a verse um, Revelation chapter 16, and there's many more than just this one, talk about proper clothing, but this is very important because this occurs right before his coming. It's talking about the sixth bowl of wrath, and in the middle of the sixth bowl of wrath, in verse 15 of chapter 16 of Revelation, Jesus says this, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. Then it gets back to the sixth bowl of wrath, and they assemble them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Keep your garments on. My garment, my covering of my nakedness is Jesus. I can't cover it myself. I can't cover my sin myself. I can't be good enough myself to cover myself. I can only be covered with the blood of Jesus. That's the only way I get in. It's the only way I make it. That's why Jesus is called the stumbling stone, because everybody stumbles over that, even Christians, because every Christian church, every Christian group has their own set of rules, their own do's and don'ts, that if you don't do this perfectly, you can't really be part of us. Well, they just made the rules for their clothing. You can't make your own rules for your clothing. The rules were made by God. Just as he clothed Adam and Eve after they first sinned. By, by clothing them with the garments of beasts. In other words, he slayed beasts, shed blood, representing the blood of Jesus to cover them. That is our covering. We will be naked if we do not have that covering on. It's not by our own good works. However, we will do righteous, good, righteous deeds when we are covered with the proper clothing. So back to Revelation chapter 19. 
Verse 1, After this I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. The great prostitute is Babylon the Great. She rules the earth. She corrupts all everything. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then the scene changes. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the Kodeshim. Okay, the bride has made herself ready. This is now after the 1260 days of preparation in the wilderness prepared by the sons of God who were glorified in chapter 12 of Revelation. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus. You have to have the word of God revealed to you in order to have testimony within yourself about Jesus. The word of God is Jesus, and until the word of God is revealed to you, you don't have the testimony. You can't have the testimony. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Well, who's this? Well, everyone knows who this is. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, his blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. The Word of, He is called the Word of God. This is Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John chapter 1. And by the way, John wrote the book of Revelation too. Do you see how deep the revelation of John is? was and the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen white and pure were following him on white horses who's this this is the kodeshim this is the sons of god and now includes the bride of christ who also is clothed in fine linen from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Interesting. King of Kings. Lord of Lords. That means there are other kings and there are other lords. He is the king of the other kings. He is the lord of the other lords. The ones coming with him are the other kings and the other lords. The ones coming with him are clothed in fine linen. They're the ones who, according to 1 John chapter 2 and 3, have now been made just like him, who see him as he is and are just like him. 
and he comes with a sharp sword from his mouth. Now you've seen the artist's image of a sword coming from the mouth of Jesus. But what does that really mean? What is the sword that comes from his mouth? It's the word of God. It's his word. It is his word that strikes down the nations. It's his word that destroys the people. It's his word that slays the people. It's his word that changes the hearts of his people. The rod of iron is his word that comes from his mouth with power because there will be power to implement the rule of righteousness. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead. Come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the, fl the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. Now birds, according to scripture, represent demons. What do we see happening in the earth now? Haven't the demons come? Aren't they already here? Aren't the demons already here? And aren't, are they not already eating the flesh of many? What is happening in the world is horrifying. I weep for them. I weep for the world. I cry for the terror that has come upon them and for what they're having to endure because they did not obey God. And so the birds are already eating their flesh. The demonic realm is already feeding on the flesh of the unbelievers and, and on the flesh of the unrepentant and upon the flesh of the believers who are undiscerning and believers who are unrepentant. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. So here, this is the eighth head of the beast and all the kings that are with him. And they gather to make war upon Christ and the Kodeshim. And the beast was captured. And with it, the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image, these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. Now the beast and the false prophet represent systems of rule in this world. They rule the world. The beast is, represents the governments that rule the world and all the governments, all the worldly governments are evil. And the false prophet is always the church of the nation that props up the government of the nation. And together, they convince the people to go the way of the beast, to go the way of the world, to go the way of Satan. They deceive the entire earth by their deception. So they're thrown into the lake of fire. Figuratively, this means that these powers, these governments and these religious systems are going to be destroyed. They're going to, to be utterly burnt up. The rest, the rest of the people, the souls of the people, were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse.
Now, how, how are you slain by the Word of God? Your way of life ends. You change. You, you stop doing evil and you start to do good. Your life is slain. Your life, the way that you live your life is gone. It's over. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. And all the demons were gorged with their, the evil things that they did. But they will not be doing the evil things anymore. They themselves, their souls will be changed. They will be converted. They will be begotten of God. And so we now live at the precipice of a new age where at least 144,000 sons of God, glorified, fully glorified people who cannot sin, are coming to rule the world in righteousness. They will be able to heal people who have harmed themselves through what's been done to them in this travesty that's occurred to the whole world over the last two years. They will be able to heal, heal the diseases that have been caused by it. They will be able to restore the life and the livelihood of the people of the earth. I don't know how many people are going to die in, this, in these coming years because the horrors afflicted are terrible. I think many will die in the flesh. But there is going to come a restoration of this earth. A new heaven and a new earth is coming. The people that are coming are going to have creative and restorative powers to change the way things are. Just as Jesus was able to create loaves of bread and fish from nothing to still the wind and the waves, so the Kodeshim, so the glorified sons of God will have power like that. All of the signs are here. We are at the end of the age. Look up. Your redemption draws nigh. When you see these things, when, just like when you see the fig trees, leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Likewise, when you see all these things happen, you know that Jesus is near. And this thing that has happened, this pandemic, has happened to the entire earth. And everything that transpired because of it came upon the whole earth, some places more forcefully than others. But you were safe nowhere from this. And it affected everyone, including my family. But God brought us through it and brought us through it without us sinning unto death and relying upon Babylon the Great for our survival instead, upon, instead of upon God. If you have taken this 
deadly thing into yourself. Repent. You will be forgiven and pray for help. Pray for the world. Pray for the world. Pray for the world. Have compassion for these ignorant souls who do not know their left hand from their right. Don't be like Jonah who did not want to see Nineveh repent. We want to see people repent. God came to restore all men. He came to bring new life to all men. And the Bible prophesies that every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. That includes everyone. Every entity. Everyone will submit to Christ. Everyone will come to repentance. Pray for the world. In Jesus, justice and mercy have kissed. 